next question from Erica is, um, back in the 1990s, the predominantly Buddhist kingdom of Bhutan forcibly exiled a large number of its citizens from the Hindu Lokshampa ethnic group. They remain refugees in other countries to this day. By doing so, has this government proven itself to be only nominally secular, but in practice a constitutional theocracy utilizing religious favoritism? So this sent me down a like wormhole today because I didn't know about this and I was very curious. Um, so upon my, okay, so like I said, I just learned about this conflict or issue today. So my analysis of this is going to be pretty surface level. Um, but when I was poking around some information and just looking for this, I think my I got the impression, and granted, oftentimes a lot of online sources, they don't want to admit the extent to which religion actually does influence these decisions. Like, I feel like people are very like protective or like really obscure, that kind of thing. Um, but I really got the impression that this is kind of more of a xenophobic um, ethnic issue or um, in some ways kind of a isolationist um, uh, measure against losing cultural identity. So what I learned is that the Slokshampa ethnic people, which is actually um, a large number of different types of ethnic groups, but they all originate from the, well, I believe they all originate from Nepal. So they came to Nepal in the night in like midway through the 19th century. And some more were brought in um, after that. And so they were all along the Southern um, regions of Bhutan. And so then Bhutan seems like they kind of went through this period of trying to really solidify, clamp down, and have a lot of conformity and rules around preserving certain aspects of their cultural heritage. Um, and, and this would even include, I learned today that Bhutan has like a dress code, like for the country. This was what? crazy to me. Yes. No. They, and I, it wasn't clear to me the extent to which this is enforced, but in, in public and in, in business hours, there is like a dress code for the nation. You're right. And especially oh. when you're going into certain types oh, no, of this is government. For, no, not for the entire country. It's like, it's compulsory for all Bhutanese to wear a national dress code in schools, government offices, and formal occasions. So not all the time. Yes, but this is something that is like regulated on the government level. And so they wow. were forcing a lot of, maybe it was different back in the 80s and 90s, and maybe it's loosened up now. But back in the 80s and 90s, when all this um, uh, favoritism started to happen, or all these divisions started to happen around the Nepali um, origin Lakshampas, when they would they would force the Lakshampas to wear this form of these these Bhutanese clothing. And so this started to um, cause a lot of issues. And then it, it eventually resulted in full blown expulsion. And what preceded this was a census that was like, strictly applied in the south where this ethnic group was, to identify who's citizens and non citizens when many of these people their, you know, lineages had been living in the country since the mid 19th century. So to me, that reads much more as a very xenophobic policy, um, a very isolationist and very, very focused on, you know, kind of preserving a very tight cultural identity and very tight conformity. But of course, um, I can well imagine that the fact that these Nepalis had a Hindu faith by the, like, the majority of them were Hindus that definitely had to play a role in it, especially since the Bhutanese government does seem to have a, a very firm interest in mandating a certain level of conformity. Um, that's obviously very dissimilar and they couldn't seem to tolerate it. Um, I, I was very, it was very interesting to, to learn about this today. I was, I was, the dress code thing shocked me. Yeah, that's insane. I, I I always thought like Bhutan was this like chill place that people didn't take things so seriously, and everybody was just chill, and just let, let, let you know, especially because they have like this world you know this happiness index. I thought like everybody was just happy and people were just like 
cool with each other. Apparently, I have, I have no idea about how anything is in Bhutan. So I was wrong. Wait, isn't Bhutan also the one with the the crazy flag, right? And also where you go to... <laughs> Define crazy flag. Um, I know the Nepali flag is the one that's actually oh, yeah, cut no. with the triangles. Yeah, yeah, no, sorry, that was Nepal. Uh, yeah, also, but what, what I found interesting, and again, this was a very cursory examination, was it seems like an emphasis on an emphasis on conformity, and like a a tight preservation of their cultural traditions was very important in Bhutan to the point of being like very um, authoritarian, like which isn't cool at all. That yeah. I think, like, you know, having a country with a rich cultural heritage um, is, um, you know, important to preserve, but not to the point of, like, regulating it and making people dress a certain way. It makes more sense if it's regulated for architecture. Um, I think that's actually, like, pretty cool because then you get to have very interesting buildings that are very distinct to your region. Um but in terms of people's personal freedoms, I find that very violating. See, I keep getting Bhutan and Nepal confused. Like one of them is Hindu, the other one is Buddhist. I thought it was the other way around. Which one? Which one is it that you go for Everest? Is it Nepal or Bhutan for climbing Nepal. Mount Everest? Nepal. And which one is it that Buddha was born in? Was it Nepal or Bhutan? Bhutan. Nepal. Nepal. Wow, you know, you know the. Why do I? We, okay. So in my defense, they're pretty close. Um, that's why I'm getting always getting them confused. But anyways, um, okay, cool. We learned a lot today about um, Bhutan. Atheist Republic needs your help. We have been the target of many legal attacks by Hindu nationalists ever since our founder Armin Abhabi blasphemed against Hindu deities. We have retained legal counsel to help us defend our access to our community in India. We have started a fundraiser that will help us afford to tackle many legal issues, including judicial harassment and censorship. Whatever you can contribute will go a long ways in helping us in this fight. Link in the description below.